Another fundamental question we try to answer in modern physics is what is stuff made of? How do I know whether something is made of positive charges, negative charges, neutral, uncharged particles? How do I know where those fundamental particles are located? How do I know what's holding them together? And when these things are very, very small, I can't just go and look at them. Well, the way we answer that question in physics is by taking the mystery target, the thing that you want to study, and we bombard that thing with incoming particles or light. So this might be a shower of electrons, it might be a shower of protons or helium nuclei, or it might be light. What's going to happen is when the incoming stuff gets near the target, there's going to be some sort of interaction, right? It might be an electric force, it might be a magnetic force, it might be some combination of the two. Uh, but what we do is we send in this incoming stuff at different heights, different, different locations there, and we watch what happens with the outgoing angle. Because this stuff is coming in really high energy, it's going to have this interaction, and then it's going to come off at a different angle than it came in at, right? So you're going to measure your angles with respect to the horizontal here. So this thing would have an outgoing angle of zero. This thing would have an outgoing angle of, say, 30. This thing would have an outgoing angle of, say, 45 degrees. And so what you do is you take your detector or your wall or whatever is over here, and you look at different locations. Right? You look at how many of the incoming particles or how much of the incoming light is coming into this location. So at each one of these points, you're looking at how much of the stuff comes through at each of these locations. If you're looking at particles, you can look at whether those particles were attracted or repelled from the sample, because if they're attracted, then there must have been some attractive force. If they're repelled, there must have been some repulsive force that happened there. If it's light, you can look at the change in the wavelength. So you might send it in with one wavelength, and it might come out with a very different wavelength. And so by looking at those outcomes, by looking at the outgoing momentum or the outgoing energy of the particles or looking at the outcoming wavelength of the light, you can reverse engineer what the interaction was and from that figure out what the thing must be made of. And this is where a computational study is incredibly valuable because that's the one of the best ways to do that reverse engineering is to try different interaction models and see which computational model matches your experimental data. For example, let's suppose your mystery target is an atom and your incoming particles are helium nuclei, meaning it's two protons and two neutrons such that this thing has a net positive charge. Uh, if you're mostly looking at the atom's nucleus, then this is going to have a positive charge, and this is going to have a positive charge, meaning your alpha particles are going to get repelled away, and you would expect to get a certain pattern where the incoming particles seem to scatter away from the nucleus here. This is the basic idea behind the Rutherford scattering experiments. So it's actually pretty simple to model Rutherford scattering. Uh, to model the classic experiment, we're going to start with gold. So we're going to create a gold nucleus. It's going to be a sphere. We're going to give it a charge of positive 79 because that is gold's atomic number. That's how many protons it has. Uh, we set up our time step here. I know I've said this in almost every video so far, but the time step is just a small step forward in time. It just has to be a small number. There's not some magic value for it. Here's where we're going to keep track of our alpha particles. We're going to send in a shower of alpha particles at this gold nucleus. Here we set the electric constant K. This is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. It's in units of E, the fundamental charge. So the, instead of coulombs, it's got E's. Um, and then over here, we're going to animate until we have fired 500 alpha particles. So originally, we have no alpha particles. And we're going to keep going until we have fired 500 alpha particles at this uh, gold nucleus. Here is the rate command that just sets the animation rate. Ignore that line. Um, here is where we randomly choose whether we are sending an alpha particle in this frame. So in each frame, we're going to have a 10% chance of firing. So if a random number is less than 0.1, that's a 10% chance of firing an alpha particle in each frame. <clears throat> 
uh, we're going to start these alpha particles over to the left at x equals negative 1, but then our y and z coordinates are going to be randomized. They're going to be anywhere from positive 1 to negative 1, so we're taking two times a random number between 0 and 1, minus 1. So if you think about this in terms of its endpoints, random has a minimum value of 0, so y has a minimum value of negative 1. Random has a maximum value of 1, so y has a maximum value of 2 times 1 minus 1 gives you 1. So this is just a way of taking that random range from 0 to 1 and making it a random range from negative 1 to positive 1. Uh, then we're going to create an alpha particle and add it to the list. So we create a sphere and we add it to the list called alphas. And actually, let's make that a simple sphere. The simple sphere, it has fewer vertices on it, so it's, it's, it's easier on the processor. It, it doesn't change the actual physics, it just changes how intensive the code is behind the scenes. We'll give it a position vector based on the x, y, and z we just set up above. We're going to give it a velocity vector going to the right. So everybody has the same velocity vector, even though they have different position vectors. We give it a charge of negative 1. Uh, excuse me, I need to make that a 2. We're going to give it a charge of positive 2 because these are helium nuclei. They have two protons. We'll give it a mass of 4 because they have two protons and two neutrons. And we'll give it a color red just to make it distinguished from the yellow. Here's an important thing. We're going to turn on make trail. This is going to be great because wherever these things go, there's going to be a trail behind, which is what you would be able to detect uh, in your experiment, in your scattering experiment. All right, so here we're going to loop over all the alpha particles in the list. We're saying for A in alpha. We got to do a few things. We got to calculate the force, we got to update the velocity, and then we have to update the position. To calculate the force, it's literally just Coulomb's law. That's all this line is. So it's the K, Q1, Q2, right? You take the charge of the two things, multiply it together. It's the same thing you had in physics too. Then you divide by R squared. This is the distance between the gold particle and the alpha particle squared. Uh, since the gold is at 0, 0, 0, we can make this nice and easy on ourselves. It's just the magnitude of A's position squared. And then we have to turn this thing into a vector, right? So this piece here is wonderful. It will give you the magnitude of the force, but I have to turn that into a vector in order for this to work in 3D. So to do that, we multiply by a unit vector. This is just saying it's the direction of A dot pause, right? Uh, so let's see, so then we update the velocity. Again, this equation, this is just the update based on F equals MA. So F equals M times delta V over delta T. All we do is multiply by delta T over M, delta T over M. That gives you the change in velocity. So in each frame, I need to take velocity and add to it delta V. Again, this plus equals just means add to. It means take this number and add something to it. So that's what I have right here. I have velocity plus equals force over mass times dt. That's what I have right here, force over mass times delta t. Exact same thing I have there. Then we do a similar thing with the position here. We add to the position velocity times dt. That's just a rearranged version of delta v equals delta x over delta t. It's just a way of taking our physics equation that we know from physics 1 and putting it in a way that the computer can understand. Uh, and then we're going to stop these things when they get too far away. So whenever they're, uh, whenever they're a, a distance of square root of 3 away from the, alpha, from the gold nucleus, then we'll just have them stop, and that's where we'll collect them at the detector. There's nothing magic about this distance. It's just far away. right? You can make this 1,000 if you wanted to. It's just your code animation is going to get bigger. All right, let's take a look at what happens with this thing. Here we have our gold nucleus. And here we have our first alpha particles coming in. You can rotate this around to see them move in 3D. Notice they are all starting off to the left, but their Y and their Z values are randomized. They've all got the same velocity coming in. You notice as they get closer to the gold nucleus, they start to deflect because these are positive charges. This is a positive charge. So for positive times positive, it gives you a repulsive force. <clears throat> what I notice about this as an experimentalist is that the particles that are closer to the nucleus deflect way more than the particles that are farther away. See, this one gets really close, and it deflects by this really big angle. 
Whereas these out here are very far away from it, they hardly deflect at all. So that tells me that I have a, not only do I have a repulsive force, but I have a force that gets stronger the closer the two particles get together. This is how you can experimentally explore Coulomb's law, this one over r squared, where the force gets stronger the closer that you get. You can take that this one really got ejected far away. Uh, and so based on this view, as an experimentalist, I could tell what the type of force is, that this is a repulsive force that gets stronger the closer you get. And by really analyzing the data in detail, I could eventually discover the one over r squared, which tells me that it's probably an electric repulsion and I'm dealing with opposite charges. So this is how you can tell that the nucleus is made of positive charge because when you send positive charges at it, all those positive charges fly away. Now the reverse should also be true. If I send negative charges in, then they should attract to it, right? So you might change this to a negative. So let's say we change it to a negative one to represent an electron. Press control two to run. So now these are electrons. Pretend they are, pretend they are electrons instead of protons, whatever, however that looks different in your mind. What's gonna happen now is that these things are going to get attracted. You see this one's curving over to the left now. Uh, let's wait for one to get in really close. Okay, this one's going to come in pretty close, so I should expect this newest one to deflect uh, this way. What you get is a different deflection pattern. So this tells me that these things are being attracted. So if I know that these incoming things are negative charges, then I know that this nucleus here is definitely a positive charge. Look at that nice deflection right off the edge there, really cool. Uh, this, this size is definitely not scaled. Don't worry about it actually hitting the nucleus. It's not very likely to happen. You notice you get a different deflection pattern. Uh, I could even, for example, change the nature of the force, right? Let's suppose I'm trying to determine what this force is. What if it? What if I'm in a different universe and it goes like one over r to the fourth? I can just change that uh, mag a dot pause to the fourth power instead. Control two to run. What I'll see now is that I get a different deflection pattern because the things that are closer are going to get way more deflected, while the things that are farther away are going to get way less deflected. Ooh, that was a very strong deflection there. That one actually turned around, it looks like. Uh, we might be getting a little bit of an error there. Yeah, you can see this one actually turns around. It gets, it gets deflected so much stronger. And so based on the different deflection pattern you have by doing many, many particles, you can tell what this thing is made of and what kind of force is acting between them.